Hi guys. So today I'd like to talk to you guys a little bit about ecosystems and specifically the flow of energy and nutrients through those ecosystems. I'm sitting out here in the sun today and there's a reason because, well, hey, it's nice, but B, the sun's energy provides almost all of the energy that's used by all living organisms here on earth. The energy that we take in every day really comes from the things that we eat. We're heterotrophs. In other words, we get our energy from other sources, other organic sources. Whereas autotrophs, plants, things like that, they are gathering sunlight and they're storing the energy in that sunlight in sugars in their bodies. Those sugars are taken in by, uh, by primary consumers and then we as secondary consumers or as primary consumers take in those sugars and use them to fuel us. Energy tends to go in a one-way flow. In other words, the energy that we take in, it doesn't get recycled. Now, it's true that with conservation of energy, energy is neither created nor destroyed. However, the energy that we use gets released, generally as heat. For example, forgive me if I'm a little incoherent today, I went for a long run, or at least for me a long run. And if you go for a run, if you do any athletic activity, one of the things you'll notice is you get hot. Nothing that we do is 100% efficient. And as you move, as you run, a lot of the energy that you're releasing, a lot of the energy that's stored in your blood glycogen and things, and things like that, that gets released as heat. And there's no real way to retrieve that energy. It gets released as heat, and we don't get it back from the environment. So energy flows to us from the sun, and then gets stored every level that it goes through. For example, in the plants, in the primary consumer, some of that energy gets released as heat and is lost pretty much forever from our ecosystem. Now, the same thing is not true about, in, about nutrients. Nutrients, things like water, things like carbon, things like phosphorus and nitrogen, they're reused again and again and again in the cycle. In the same way, they're not destroyed. You can never create or destroy um, chemical species in, unless you're talking about a nuclear reaction, and those aren't happening in a biological system. So really, those nutrients get passed around again and again and again and again. And what I want to take a look at today are the ways that those get passed around, because we end up reusing these multiple, multiple times. So what I want to take a look at first is the water cycle. Now, the water cycle is something you're probably aware of and probably see every day. Most of the water that's present on our planet is present in the oceans. A very, very small percentage of the water is present as either ice on Greenland and Antarctica or in permanent glaciers or as fresh water in lakes and streams. But primarily, we're going to start out looking at a large body of water like an ocean or a lake. Now, as the sun shines on this and it heats up, you get evaporation. Water particles leave the liquid state and go into the gaseous state. They're up in the air as water vapor. Now, as air becomes saturated with water vapor, we might see condensation. This is particularly true when that water vapor gets pushed up to higher altitudes where it might be a little cooler. For example, air getting pushed over a mountain will tend to produce a lot of condensation. I grew up in a town in New Mexico where almost every afternoon we'd have a thunderstorm, and it's simply because the air warmed up during the course of the day, and then it got pushed over the side of a mountain, and as it did, that warm, moist air cooled off, and you get precipitation. Now that precipitation lands and turns into runoff. Precipitation that doesn't soak into the ground will run off in the form of streams and creeks and whatnot, and might make its way back to oceans and lakes eventually. However, some of that water enters into the soil and can be taken up by the roots of plants. That's called root uptake. Now, that water that is seeped into the soil and taken up by the plants goes into the plants. Water is used in photosynthesis, yes, but a lot of the water is then returned to the atmosphere through a process called transpiration, where basically water is evaporating out of the leaves and stems of plants. So it's returned to the atmosphere. The water is neither created nor destroyed in this process. Now, it's true that in some processes, water can get split up. It doesn't stay as H2O. We can release the hydrogen, we can release the oxygen, and various other things. For example, photosynthesis. We split water 
to provide a source of electrons. That's why water, along with CO2, are two of the things that go into the equation that produces sugar and oxygen. And in the same way, in respiration, we generate water by taking in oxygen and bur burning glucose in its presence. So it's true that water can get formed and destroyed, but in general, most of the water that's around us gets recycled again and again and again. And it's certainly true that the individual atoms, the hydrogen and the oxygen, aren't created or destroyed. Now, another atom that's very important to life on Earth is carbon. We see carbon in all sorts of forms. It's the basis of most of the, of the molecules in our body. We are organic, in other words, carbon-based life forms. Now, most of the carbon that we see in the atmosphere is in the form of carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is taken in by plants. And we're going to see that it follows a relatively complicated cycle. In fact, the carbon cycle is a biogeochemical cycle. One of the things that we're going to see is that we have living things. We also have geological processes and chemical processes that are going on and that all play a role. Now, in the carbon cycle, it's important to realize that a lot of the carbon that's present on our planet or above our planet is in the form of CO2 gas. That CO2 gas uh, takes up a large percentage of the atmosphere. Now, plants during the course of photosynthesis take in CO2 gas. That CO2 gas enters into them and they use it as the raw material to provide the carbon in order to create um, the sugars that make up their bodies and the sugars that we in turn eat because that's how we're getting carbon as animals, is we're either eating plants or we're eating animals who have eaten those plants. Now, so far, we're just taking CO2 gas out of the atmosphere, and that wouldn't be sustainable. Yes, CO2 gas is only a few percent of the atmosphere, but the fact that it's there is actually very important for us. It's an important greenhouse gas. Now, you hear a lot of things about greenhouse gases being terrible, and too much of them certainly is. However, without greenhouse gases at all, there would be wild fluctuations in temperature between day and night, and the Earth would be completely unlivable. So having a certain amount of CO2 is really important. Plus, without it, plants wouldn't be doing very well. Now, the, rate, the way things get back to the atmosphere is through the process of respiration. When we take that sugar and we burn it in the presence of oxygen, we're releasing CO2. Now, this seems like a closed loop. Nothing would ever change. However, carbon can also be returned to the ground in the form of either waste matter or dead plants and animals. And that produces organic material in the soil. That organic material in the soil can then be worked on by decomposers, either fungi or bacteria or something like this, and their life processes may return the CO2 to the atmosphere in the form of CO2 gas. Alternately, organic material in the soil can be transformed through millions of years of geological processes into what we know as fossil fuels. Now those fossil fuels form a reservoir deep within the earth and can really only be reintroduced to the air through human activity. If you dig up coal and you burn it in a power plant, the CO2 that's produced is going to up the amount of CO2 gas in, in the atmosphere. And it's gonna do it at a rate that's much higher than organic material in the soil is being turned into fossil fuels. And that's one of the reasons that people are concerned about human activity influencing the amount of greenhouse gas. We've tipped the balance and we're using fossil fuels at a rate that's much higher than the rate at which they're being produced. Now it's certainly true that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is, well, actually probably a pretty good thing. Some amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is probably a pretty good thing. A little bit of the greenhouse effect is essential to moderate temperatures, to make sure that the difference between day and night temperatures aren't so extreme. If you didn't have any greenhouse gases, the world would be a very difficult place in which to live. However, it's also true that with too much in the way of greenhouse gases, that greenhouse effect can go completely beyond the pale, and we end up with a situation like we have on the planet Venus, where the planet is incredibly hot, and much of the radiation is trapped in there um, forever, kept in by this blanket of greenhouse gases, and you get surface temperatures that are completely incompatible with life. So the release of more and more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere 
is a pressing concern, and it's something that we want to take a look at in greater detail later. I hope this has helped you understand how individual nutrients are cycled again and again throughout ecosystems. Now, it's not to say that carbon and water are the only things that are cycled. Like I said, phosphorus, nitrogen, many other nutrients are cycled again and again and again. And we could go into all of those. But I hope this has given you a good indication of some of the more basic cycles and an idea of where kind of we're coming from. Hope you have a good day. Take care.